Okay, so folks, uh, we're going to get uh, started here. Um, uh, today's uh, lecture is going to build on a material that we covered last time, um, specifically the model that we were building up here in class uh, involving uh, uh, mobility, involving uh, geographic space, and involving uh, elements of hybrid modeling and infectious disease spread. So uh, you folks will recall that uh, during the uh, last uh, class, um, we had uh, started uh, the construction of this model. Um, uh, specifically, we had placed within the model a set of, uh, of particular agents um, involving people, yes, but also uh, clinics, uh, people's homes, um, or workplaces. And all of this was placed within a geographic context. Um, the geographic context in our case being of the fair city of Saskatoon. Um, uh, upon running this model, we saw uh, a map of the geographic context laid out. Um, and we saw uh, individuals, um, uh, individual agents uh, shown here on the map. Um, we uh, further had particular locations which we had picked out geographically um, uh, as being associated with certain notable positions within the community. Namely, for the clinics, we had picked out the Royal University Hospital and uh, West Winds Clinic, um, a West Side Clinic, St. Paul's Hospital, and City Hospital. Those were marked at defined locations within this GIS space. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I don't know how I missed that. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so I guess I had assumed that it was already being displayed, but um, looks like I was in error. Um, OK. Um, so uh, what we have now is, is a good start. Um, it was a start whereby we had um, uh, we had included this GIS information, but it was not it was not something which really included much dynamics. We have video, but no uh, no recording. No sound. Okay. Uh, could you um, could you get Merlin in here? Thank you. Um, so uh, currently, we had uh, individuals. You recall that we associated with persons, with a workplace, and with a home. Um, we further associated uh, those different agents, uh, such as homes, with a certain location. Clinics uh, were defined a location based on their geographic position. Workplaces also had a location associated with them. And because we seem to have uh, some audio issues, uh, according to someone who's monitoring it, I thought I'd go check um, the sound. We seem to be getting sound here. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what the issue is with, uh, with YouTube. Um, so uh, Merlin, maybe you could work uh, some with uh, Aiden, because it seems to be getting audio uh, just fine here. So uh, I think it must be something to do with the YouTube um, broadcast. Sorry, what's, what's that? Oh, OK, so you're not getting it over there. Right. Yes. Here it seems to be fine, yeah. Sorry? Oh, it's fine on YouTube? OK, so maybe, maybe it's an issue with the client, with the local computer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks much for letting me know. It sucks. <laughs> so um, Linux is also great. Um, <laughs> every OS, I'm afraid, it sucks and is great at some things. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here's our running model. Now. This model thus far exhibits no dynamics, but we did bind people to certain locations, workplaces uh, uh, workplaces, and homes were lent explicit locations, which we found at random places within the city. 
uh, you'll recall, associated with uh, with the uh, populations of each of them. Yes. Oh, uh, uh, mumble. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, yes. Uh, okay, so it must be displaying the wrong monitor. So uh, give me just a second to learn how to frob this. Um, so, uh, ah, there we go. Okay, cool. Thanks, Alex. It's great. Okay, so each of these populations was associated with a location that was defined by a random point inside of it, but these clinics were placed at locations found in a different way. Well, how did we place the location of the clinic? Does anyone remember? We did something very important. We didn't just distribute it at random locations within Saskatoon. Instead, how did we define its location for the clinics? Who can remember? Yeah, we placed it in a GIS location. So the, so the location of the clinics, in contrast to the location associated with the, uh, with the agents like homes and workplaces, was defined by um, uh, the empirical that is actually known locations uh, of healthcare facilities within Saskatoon. So not only did we have a Saskatoon context geographically, we actually had particular um, locations of note being captured by agents in the model. So we had a region, Saskatoon, and we had points within that area being captured associated with resources. Today, we're going to expand on this further. We're going to see in other ways in which location influences things. For example, the relative location of a clinic to a person is going to make a difference in their behavior. The, so the distance, say, that they have to go. Um, beyond that, uh, the mode of travel will be along these thoroughfares. It's actually not essential for the purposes of this model, but it's something we'll illustrate uh, to as by way of showing you um, this basic principle that, that the GIS information can be used to sort of capture the pathways of, of motion. In general, we may have other uses of GIS information. Um, for example, information about certain regions within the city um, might be uh, used to influence the agents. For example, we could have agents being affected by poor air quality within a certain region of Saskatoon, maybe near the bus barns, where you know, large amounts of diesel might be present. We could have agents affected by that in the model. Um, alternatively, we could have agents affecting their environment, cases of vandalism or, or cases of, um, of uh, destruction of vegetation by, uh, by army worms or what have you. GIS context, the fact that we can capture this kind of context allows us to capture not just fixed locations, static regions, but allows us to capture dynamics involving the environment and involving agents. We're just going to touch on certain elements of this environment, but you should be aware that GIS um, information such as this is often uh, plays a role in shaping um, Agent, uh, agent evolution, as it will here, and it being shaped by agent evolution. Okay, um, We are going to engage in today's discussion, moreover, tying this in with agent dynamics, but also tying it in with interventions. So we'll examine the effect, for example, of adding more clinics to the space so that we can see the effects on agent behavior and, in fact, on outcomes associated with this. So right now, we start with a, uh, a static model, and we'll build towards a dynamic model. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that model is posted to Moodle. So if there's anyone out there who had difficulty uh, following along, they weren't able to, um, to build the model, uh, or for some reason they were absent from class last time, I believe that you should be able to, uh, to find it here within Moodle for download, okay, and I'll, I'll just go uh, confirm my, my impression here, okay. Um, 
So models built in class, there it is. Uh, this GIS model um, mobility infection spread, you can download it and you're off to the races. Okay. Sorry? Oh, it's not on there for a student. Okay, so thank you for letting me know. Um, much appreciated. Let's turn it on and let's just go see if it is uh, okay. It thinks it's there, but um, uh, so not under models built in class. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to now uh, jump into the next phase of this work um, in the form of. Uh, uh, going and adding dynamics uh, to individuals, okay? Um, great. So um, in order to do that, we're going to go back to Maine, and uh, we're going to first, to put in dynamics associated with people, we're going to first add a population of people, okay? Um, and... Uh, We've already got a person here with a certain representation. So we'll go to main and we'll drag in person to form a population of people. This will be called population. We'll bring this around. And we'll create a population of agents. And the size of this population will be um, this dot population size. Okay. What is population size? What am I referring to here? Whence does this come? Anyone? Where does that come from? It's a parameter here, yeah. And what that means is we'll be able to, in different scenarios, modify that parameter and see its impact on the dynamics, okay? So here we're parameterizing the model, as we tend to do in software engineering, to allow for flexibility. Um, we have abstraction through parameterization by taking a model. We can create a more general model by parameterizing things out that are otherwise hard-coded. And in my software engineering classes, I introduce another type of, of uh, abstraction, abstraction by specification, where we allow for generality by, by uh, just saying, whatever the implementation of this code is, it has to match this interface, it has to match this contract, and any implementation is fine as long as it matches that contract. This is parameterization by, um, uh, by uh, excuse me, uh, abstraction by parameterization. Okay, so for the homes, ladies and gentlemen here, um, for each person in this population, we need to set a home. So I'd like to set them to have a certain home, and specifically where you're going to say their home is this.homes.random, okay? Um, that's going to pick a, a random home. And I'm going to set their workplace to be, guess what? Guess what that's going to be? Yeah, this.workspaces.random, yeah. Um, Remember, ladies and gentlemen, autocomplete is your friend. Or workspaces, workplaces, sorry, workplaces, uh, dot random, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Much appreciated when you can uh, help each other out like that. That's great. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now we're associating each person with a workplace and with a home. And next, we're going to go down to their initial location, and we are going to set them at the initial latitude longitude as set by this dot homes, or actually, sorry, not this. What is this in this context? If I type this, what is that referring to? I'm inside of what class? I'm inside of main. So that actually refers to Maine. So I don't want to say that. I want to set the latitude according to the home of the person whose latitude is being set. To do that here, we do self. That just refers to the person being created. It's just an any logic thing. Self.home, that's this guy here, dot get latitude. Boom. And self.home, whoa, dot get longitude. 
Okay. And they will get, then be um, placed within the context of their homes, safely within their home. So there we are. People are located where? Where are people located? In their home. Thank you. Thank you. They're located in their homes, ladies and gentlemen. OK? Um, we've started them in their homes. And by luck of the draw, because each person was associated with a certain home, um, uh, there are some people, who, some homes which will have multiple people, and there are some homes which have no people associated with them. They're vacant. They're good rental units for students, among other things. Okay. So uh, just recall, homes here had a population size of population divided by three. And of course, population size of people is given by the population size. So we have an average of about three people per home. OK. Um, OK. Uh, next, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to add some dynamics uh, to a person. OK. We're going to have dynamics built up now. So I'd like you to go to person here. And I would like you, uh, within person, to add a parameter. Um, uh, you know, I think actually before we do this, um, uh, mm, right, um, okay, uh, I'm going to actually uh, have people exhibit some motion because that's a, a new component and it's not something that we'll just be repeating earlier material for. So I'd like you to go to person and go to the palette before we put in dynamics associated with infection, we are going to um, have dynamics associated with simple motion. So we're going to the state chart part of the palette. Um, I'm dragging in a state chart entry point here. And this is going to be mobility, mobility state chart. Okay, And I'd like to drag in a state here, which is going to be at home. And I'm going to drag in another state, which is going to be at work. Okay. Now, in order to capture um, uh, capture this um, in a in a more simple or more elegant way, I'm going to put in two additional states that will teach some principles. Okay. One of these states is going to be commuting to work. If this were LA, you might be spending several hours commuting. Um, this is going to be commuting from work. That's going to be the return path. And we're going to set up transitions. Where do you think these transitions will go? Give me one transition that will be here. Just looking at these. Where do you think these transitions go? Good. At home to go to, to work. Yep. Yep. And then where else? You could fill in the blanks, right? Commuting to work to work. Oh, oh at work to commuting to work. Great. And transition for commuting from work back to home. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen. Um, here, we are going to further expand our knowledge of certain components of, uh, of the any logic of vocabulary. These components today are going to be linked to this issue of spatially explicit modeling. So we're going to set them to go from home to work after 16 hours. Okay, 16 hours they had to work. They were home from 5 o'clock yesterday to 9, 9 a.m. this morning. 16 hours, ladies and gentlemen, if you count them up. Similarly, going back from work to commuting from work, um, it'll be after eight hours after arriving at work. Nine to five job, roughly. It's going to be a bit of time. 
um, during the commute, or I'll, they'll also be traveling. Okay. Um, maybe we will make it instead of they'll leave after 15.5 hours. They'll 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 leave from home to commute to work. I bike to work. It takes a little bit of extra time, particularly in the winter. So I'll leave. Try to leave about half an hour uh, early. Okay. So 15 and a half hours instead of 16, but they'll they're they stay eight hours at work. And now commuting to work, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is going to be associated not with a timeout, but with an agent arrival. What this is going to mean is when the agent arrives at the destination, however long it takes, they will then make that transition. Okay, so they're going to start moving in in this commuting to work, uh, this transition to, to commuting to work. And then they are going to, whenever they arrive, arrive at this state. Similarly, they're going to start up this way. And when they arrive, they're going to be at home. Okay, So we're going to similarly make this one from commuting uh, from work to home be dependent on the agent arrival. Okay, Now, that's all nice and good. Um, we could label the transitions. I'm going to go light on that, um, although I'd encourage um, I will probably do it after class. But ladies and gentlemen, there's something key we're missing. What are we missing here? This is all nice and good labels for things. What are we missing? What do we still have to do? What's the substance that's absent right now? Do you think if I run this, are you going to see them going to work? Hello? Are you, are you going to see them go to work if I run it now? No. What do you have to do? You have to tell it, okay, go to work. Okay. So that's what uh, we're going to do. Okay. So this is how we do it. Um, I would like you to go to um, the transition for commuting to work. Okay. And I'd like you in that transition um, to put in an action. Remember, any logic is an inversion of control system. It observes the Hollywood principle like other inversion of control systems. Sometimes it's associated with dependency injection. The Hollywood principle being, don't call us, we'll call you. We put in actions to be executed when this transition is fired, and they will get invoked when that transition happens, OK? Um, it takes care of, of choreographing all the calling. So here, what we're going to do is this dot move to, and we're going to move to um, our uh, workplace, OK? Um, workplace, and probably I should say this dot workplace if I'm going to be consistent in it, dot location, OK? Dot location, there we go. This dot workplace dot location. What is this location? Where, whence did this come? Where did this come from, this location? Who named that? Yeah, yeah, we did, right? We called it location here. That's where that comes from. We gave it a location. We assigned it a location. It was a random location within Saskatoon. OK, fine. So. We're going to tell them to move here. They're going to be moving. They're going to be in this state whilst they're moving. And as soon as they arrive, they'll go to this state. Similarly, here at work, do this dot move to um, this dot home dot location. Okay? Same basic principle. Okay. So we're going to be moving. Now, there's actually a lot going on here behind the scenes. This move to is going to figure out how to get them from their current location to the destination along a certain route. Okay, um, and we'll see where we can define something like that um, here. If we go to Maine, we go to Maine and we look at the GIS map. We could go look in routing, and we'll find that what's the routing method. So, for example, this says use the the fastest routing. You could do the shortest routing. What to do if it's not found? Should we use car routes or bike routes or foot routes or rail routes? Um, 
uh, et cetera? Or do we want to just have them go in a straight line like a bird would fly, you know, as the crow flies, so to speak? And we could say which routing server do we use, et cetera, okay? Um, so I'm going to run this thing. And what we're going to see is a little bit different um, in the sense that we're going to have now some mobility associated with uh, with individuals, okay? Um, so uh, here we go. And you'll notice I'm at 15.5 hours. And you'll notice down here, do you see this little downwards thing here? You see there's kind of a, oh, it, it just changed. Look at that. What do we see there? What do we see, ladies and gentlemen, superimposed on our fair city of Saskatoon? Who are these individuals? Where are they traveling? Looks like Circle Drive is quite crowded, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to yonder factory. Um, and here, here, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the city of Saskatoon is hard at work, except this, this one in Confed. Um, they, they're, they're arriving, oh, sorry, that's not Confed, that's like Nutana, okay. Maybe that's Dragon Industries. Um, Okay, so they've all arrived uh, at their uh, workplace uh, after 16 hours of good bed rest. Um, and each person here within this uh, is, um, is now at work, hard at work, ladies and gentlemen, like yourself. Um, and uh, after some period of time, uh, time will pass. And at at time about 24 or so, they should start to head back, head back home, right? They're going to stream out of their workplaces, um, get back on Circle Drive or wherever their work may take them, uh, and, uh, and, and they're going to head back. And you'll notice there's some routing information. This routing indicates it's communicating with the servers to figure out how to get someone from A to B by the fastest route possible. You notice that some are heading up Clarence here, some along 8th Street, um, and uh, some here along Circle Drive, right? Um, and so they're all, they're all heading home. The notable thing is they're heading home along thoroughfares within the city of Saskatoon. These are real roads, these are real locations, and they're, they are prioritized for fastest delivery from A to B. That requires a significant amount of computation, but more to the point, it also requires more a significant amount of communication. So that little symbol that we saw down here in the lower left was indicating a checking in with servers and asking what's the fastest way to get from A to B. We needed to get that information so that we could plot these routes within this environment. Now, that's a dynamic process. In principle, we could shut down routes here. We could close routes. We could add a new bridge. We could see how does that change the flow along Circle Drive? How does it change if we add a north commuter bridge up here? How does that change the, where the bottlenecks are, where, where the uh, traffic jams are, et cetera? But it is a fairly expensive process when it first goes on. You'll notice you aren't seeing it again. Anyone want to guess why? Why is it you don't see that long delay? Look at this, um, the commuters of Saskatoon um, heading back to their homes and so on. Why is it we don't see that again, that long pause? Yeah, it caches it. And in fact, if you were to go look at the model and where the model is stored, you'll find there's actually a caching folder that, that is used to, to cache the results. Because it doesn't need to ask again from A to B. Um, unless something has changed about the route. And it is possible to, to go and, and change things dynamically, but it's rather more involved, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, here we have uh, movements uh, over a landscape where the paths taken are reflective of the speeds that you can attain in certain roads, et cetera. Um, the nature of the resources. In short, aspects of the environment here are affecting how agents move around, how long it takes them to get from A to B, how long it takes their morning commute, is an endogenous function of this model. It's actually simulated as, as uh, actually here it's, it's not, it's, I, I, I'd be hesitant to call it endogenous, except to the degree that if we were to change, for example, where their home was, 
then they'd have, yes, a different, uh, different path or what have you. That's not currently in the model. Okay. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have people movement from uh, between home and, uh, and workplace and back. And now we're going to add something that is going to make it more interesting yet. We've added a bit of mobility here. So we are going to go and add some dynamics between agents within this model, okay? Um, and I'm going to use this, moreover, to teach you a little bit of finesse when it comes to language issues. Because um, I'm a software engineer at heart, and uh, I'm one that has a strong respect and strong interest in the role that language plays in shaping our software engineering. And we are going to uh, provide some of you who have not previously had this exposure, exposure to additional types of software engineering associated with functional languages. So we are going to go, ladies and gentlemen, back to main, and we are going to go drag in here a parameter to main that is going to be called count initially infected. This is going to provide an additional repertoire for capturing initial infection in a model. It's going to be of type int, and its default value, ladies and gentlemen, will be will be uh, two. Okay. Two individuals infected. Now, some of you may remember that when we built an infectious disease model uh, earlier, um, special delivery, um, uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, root password? Uh, yeah, happy, happy. OK. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, you may remember that when we had an earlier model of infectious disease spread, uh, individuals were infected first. We delivered a message to a random infected person. Now we're going to deliver it to n randomly infected people but n distinct randomly infected people. How would you do that? So suppose, suppose I told you, part of an assignment, um, I'd like you to deliver, I'd like you to infect n people at the beginning of simulation, um, that they need to be n distinct people within the population. How would you, how would you accomplish that? Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. So good. You're going to infect random people, but can you just for each iteration of that loop? So I welcome that suggestion. It's a very, it's an excellent starting point for each. Iteration, you just pick anyone at random, anyone at all that isn't already infected. Okay. So suppose you pick someone who is already infected. What would you do? So, okay, so, so I'm going through the loop. I, I loop from 1 to, let's say, 10, the number of people, right, to n people. Suppose n is 10. So I go through, I infect the first person. Go through, I infect the second. Um, it, that, I choose a person. They're not infected. I infect them. I go through, and the third person, I, by chance, happen to pick one of the people that was already infected. What do I do? Okay, maybe add one. Okay, by luck, I get the other person that's infected. What do I do again? Maybe add one to the counter again. Or a more common thing is to do what's called resampling. You just roll the dice again, right? So if you have a six-sided die, ever encounter those? Yeah, some, some of you, right? Um, um, OK, so you have a six-sided die, and, and you want to actually generate numbers between 1 and 5, a random number between 1 and 5. What do you do? You roll it, and if you get a 6, you just roll it again, right? Until you get one between one and five, that actually works pretty well. Uh, yes. You may, yes. Uh, nope, nope, no, nope, nothing at all. Thanks very much, Carrie. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, we could do it. It would have a loop and then an inner loop to sort of re-pick to see if it's already infected potentially. 
depending, we wouldn't have to do it here, but potentially we have to keep a list around of who we've already infected so we know they're in that list. Ladies and gentlemen, compare that to this, okay? Um, okay, so we're going to go, I'm going to show you a different way to do it with functional programming um, in Java 8. Java 8 supports uh, a limited uh, functional repertoire, and um, I'd like to introduce you to it. So I'm going to create an event from the uh, agent palette, ladies and gentlemen, and this is going to be called initial infection. Initial infection, okay? It occurs once at time zero. Happy, happy. Okay. Um, the whole purpose of an event typically is to have an to undertake an action when it fires, whether it's a repeat event, an event going off at a certain hazard rate, a chance per unit time, or whether it's an event that goes off at certain defined times every one year exactly or just once. So the whole purpose of it is typically put in place in action. This again is part of any logic's adherence to the Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we'll call you. It'll take care of calling your code at the right times. Okay, so this is what I want to do. And unfortunately, because we don't have an import, there's a little bit of cruft up front. Um, so we're going to say java.util.stream in lowercase dot capital stream dot generate. Okay. Um, okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to um, uh, generate, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, a stream. And uh, for, for each element of that stream, we're going to draw a random number. Okay. Um, and this random number will be um, actually, we're going to draw a random person from the population. Okay, so here we have Java that you tilde dot stream dot stream dot generate. Okay, and we're going to tell it this is how to generate each element. This is anyone recognize what this is that I'm putting in here? What is that thing that I'm putting in? Yes, it's a function. It's a fact a closure, meaning it's a it's a function wrapped up with an environment. Because some folks might have trouble seeing this, I'm going to to go call this up here, and I will try to make this a big font worthy of the Hollywood principle. Okay, here we go. What do you think? Ooh, um, maybe that's a bit too big. Uh, okay, so how about this? Boom. There we go. Okay, so so what this is doing is it's, it's generating a stream. Each element of the stream is going to be generated by this function. This function takes what arguments? Nothing as an argument. So when it's called, it, it doesn't require anything to be given to it, and it just generates random people from the population. And those people that it generates the population could be the same, right? It might, by luck, draw the same person first three times. OK. Or for 10 times. OK. Now, this is what we do. This is where it gets really sweet. We do dot distinct, OK? Begin paren, end paren. Okay, we, want, we want a distinct stream, no repeats, OK? It takes care of that. And then we're going to say limit, and I'll, I'll put it up on the big screen, this dot count initially infected. Boom. Count initially infected, OK? and. This is basically going to give me, what is this going to give me? Can anyone tell me? Let me, let me uh, make this a little bit smaller here uh, so we can all see it. Here we go. Boom. What is that going to give me? What's the result of this going to be? It's going to be a stream. Um, this is generating a stream of, of randomly chosen people. This is going to be a, a stream of what? Distinct randomly generated people. It's the same as the first stream, but but we've eliminated duplicates. Okay, just the distinct ones. We leave out if we see a re rep repeat, we just leave it out. Now we limit it to be only how long? The count of limited, the count of infected people. So now we've got a stream, ladies, 
gentlemen, of count initially infected people, say 10 people, that is distinct. Hmm? And now, ladies and gentlemen, the coup de grace. For each of those people, or each, what are we going to do to them? Speak on as in one voice. And again, we're going to infect them. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so we're going to take, for each of those people, we're going to take them as an argument. So for each takes a function to do its job. This function takes in a person. Okay, we'll call them person. Just make them more dignity. We'll say person. We take in a person, call person, and we tell them receive the message infected. Infected. Okay. Oh. Um, and, and then we need a closing paren here. Okay. Now, this is getting a little bit long, so I'll, I'll put this down on the next line. Okay. That, that's what we want. Oh, dot receive, not receive, duh, dot receive, okay? There we go. So, generate this again. This generates a stream, ladies and gentlemen, of randomly chosen people from the population, willy-nilly. It doesn't consider if a person was repeated twice, it could be the same person 10 times, followed by another person, followed by that first person, followed by yet another. Uh, it just random draws from these people. This distinct says, hey, limit that to distinct ones so we don't have any repeats. Now we limit it so we get exactly count initially infected people. So we get 10 people, say, 10 distinct people from the population. And then for each of them, for each of those people, we take that person and we tell them, hey, received an infected message. Does that make sense? Ladies and gentlemen, there's someone at the front of the room where that almost brings tears to his eyes. Just gorgeous. Compared to doubly nested loops where you have to keep track of, did I do that one before and the track? Um, okay, so I promise I'll try not to weep, but but let's, let's continue before I do, okay? Um, okay, so I just... Uh, just uh, built it, and it's a happy camper, okay? So this infects count initially infected people, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, um, spring is added to my step. Um, let's, let's go now, because right now, what's the effect of sending them that message? They got the message, but do they listen to it right now? Not particularly. I mean, right now that they're not really paying attention to it. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to person and let's give them a message. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to go um, uh, to uh, the person class, and we are going to add in an infection. Okay, so before this. Actually, I want to add a couple parameters to main just to make our life a little bit easier and cleaner. Ladies and gentlemen, to main, I'd like to add the following parameters. Number one, a parameter here called, um, uh, called uh, uh, incubation, mean incubation duration. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, um, we could call this a double. Does anyone remember what are the units of this model? I'm saying this because you've got to be thinking about this. What are the units? Hours, ladies and gentlemen. So this will have to be in hours. Okay. Um, we're going to need to specify it in hours. Now, what we can do. There's a couple ways we can finesse this in any logic, so it's particularly nice. What I'm going to actually write here is uh, the mean infection duration, ladies and gentlemen, um, excuse me, mean uh, incubation duration 
is going to be three times day. Okay. And basically that's gonna that's gonna return hours per day. So calling day is hours per day. And so this is gonna be three times twenty-four in this case, or seventy-two. Okay. That's mean incubation duration. Next, uh, we're going to put into place um, uh, uh, contacts uh, per per day. We'll put into place. Okay. Um, um, okay. So this will be um, uh, maybe we'll do it actually contact rate. So this is an an hourly uh, contact rate. Okay. Um, and we are going to do one per day, okay? Um, where where again, calling day is is hours per day. In this case, it's a double precision value. So this is going to be one divided by twenty four. But to make sure it's it's all nice and double, we'll we'll do one point zero divided by it. And then there's going to be um, a mean, uh, mean um, uh, infection duration. Here we go. Mean, mean infection duration. Okay, and that is going to be, in this case, uh, ten days. Okay, ten times day. So this helps sort of be clear about the um, the values. Now, I will note that in any logic, we could further delineate these as time, and we'll come and explore that later. You notice if we say it's a time explicitly, we could say this is a days, but it turns out there's some subtleties there I'm going to have to come to later, and I don't have time to, to go into them right now. I'll do that at a later point. So here's 10 days, okay? Um, so we have these uh, three parameter, and um, and we are uh, we're in good shape. Okay, next I'd like you to go to person. Okay, here we go. And uh, within person, we are going to go to the state chart. Uh, sorry, to the palette. Hey, come on, get back here. Um, there we go. Okay, so we're going to add an infection state chart here from the palette. Okay, here we go. Uh, infection state chart. And we're going to add in susceptible. You guessed it. Exposed. Maybe you didn't guess it. Um, this is going to be people who are infected, but not infectious. This is going to be infective. And this is going, oh, infective. And this is going to be, uh, the last one um, is going to be, um, let's see, I guess uh, recovered. Um, yeah, recovered, okay. Um, and we're going to eventually have loss of immunity. Recovered. There we go. Okay, recovered. Uh, there we go. Okay, hey, ladies and gentlemen. Next, we are going to set up um, uh, messages here. Oh, sorry, messages. We're going to set up transitions, bringing us from each to the next. And we are going to provide these later ones with rate transitions. So this one will be called, for example, recovery. And it's a good practice to show names for these. I didn't do that earlier, but I will here. This is called um, becoming infective. And uh, this will be uh, a rate transition as well. And this transition, what sort of transition will this be for an infectious disease model? This top one, what will that be? Anyone? 
yeah, it'll be a message transition. So this is going to be called infection, and it's going to be a message transition here. There we go. Message. Boom. Ladies and gentlemen. And, and then this one will be, uh, sorry, uh, short name. Boom. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, okay. So um, let's go set these things up. Becoming infective, um, the, what do you think the rate is going to be? Based on what we've placed in Maine, what do you think the rate is going to be to go from, from um, exposed to infected? If this is a hazard rate, yeah, excellent. One over mean duration, excuse me, mean, uh, mean incubation duration, yeah. Um, and for recovery, similar principle, one over mean, mean, mean infection duration. Okay, there we go. Great. Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to further put into place a transition within infective here that is going to be called what? What does this represent? While someone's infected, what special thing happens? Yeah, they can infect others. This is a contact, right? Um, and here it's occurring at a certain rate as given by main dot contact rate. Okay. Notice that all these are per hour here. Ladies and gentlemen, we could specify them instead as a per day rate, and maybe for these things it would be more natural. Okay. Um, so that's good. Um, let's suppose we further wanted uh, to, uh, to track people's... Uh, uh, well, okay. So we have a contact rate. What's missing here? So this contact rate occurs. What, why is that not enough for this guy? Why is this not enough? What are we missing? Yeah, I mean, after all, this is a transition neither, leave, it doesn't even leave the state, so it needs to send a message. So what we're going to do is this dot send, you know, there's a lot of choices here, send to all, send to random connected, and it will send a message infected, okay, to that random connected person when it occurs. Now, that random connected person, if they're susceptible, what will happen to them? What's going to happen if they're susceptible? Yeah, they'll, they'll transition here. What if they're not susceptible? Suppose they're recovered, or suppose they're already exposed or infected. What will happen? Yeah, they just discard the message. There's no message transition out of those states, so that message will be discarded. It will fall on stony ground. It won't, it won't sink in. It's only if they're susceptible that it will catch. And that provides a limit, just as we saw earlier, a few weeks ago, or you know, classes ago, we were talking about limits to infection. If you're surrounded by lots of susceptibles, you can infect lots of people. If you're surrounded by few susceptibles, most of the people around you are not susceptible. You'll be gonna, you're going to be sending to a lot of people who are not in a susceptible state. A lot of people who are in one of these other states, exposed, infected, and recovered. Okay? Um, so all that's good. Um, we just don't have much in the way of sort of way of, of noting who's infected and who's not. And it's, it's kind of nice to do that. So let's go on a, a quick march. Uh, drag in a variable called uh, color, um, C-O-L-O-U-R, what's its type? Anyone tell me? Other, and what's the type here? Color, it's going to be black initially. Um, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, in susceptible, we're going to assign it to color, this dot color. Uh, equals green, uh, exposed, we're going to set it 
to be, uh, we'll set it to be uh, magenta. Uh, infective, we'll set it to be red. Make sure it's a semicolon there. Um, this is, after all, it's a statement, it's a command. We're not computing a value, we're saying do this. And so we need this, um, we need this uh, to be to have a semicolon, and here it will be gray, okay, um, uh, and it will just be the gray color for for recovered. Okay, so here we have this color. It's set to these different ones. I could color this nicely. I said color equals green. I actually prefer lime, um, nice and bright. Um, exposed here, I said do magenta. Infective here, I said do red and recovered here. What I'm doing now, it does not have to be done, but it's kind of nice touch to to set uh, set those color codes. And finally, we're going to need to set this guy's color to be uh, accord with that. So go to projects to set this guy's color. We're going to go to projects. You can engage in frobbing behavior, um, and uh, it, it may prove useful, but go to person, go down to person, here go to shape body, go to appearance, set the fill color to be what? What do I set this to? If I want to set this guy to be given by this color, what do I set the fill color to? Notice I changed it to this, from this to this. Yeah, this dot color. Okay. How did I do that? Well, I could have engaged in frobbing behavior with this. And, but the problem is sometimes you have to click it a little bit. And here it's not that bad. But um, went to appearances. I changed this from being fixed to being this and put in this dot color. Okay, what should happen when we run this model now? Anyone? What are we going to see? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, well, we're going to see an error. Okay, uh, mean infection duration cannot be resolved. Okay, this dot mean. Oh, uh, mean in. Whoop, I said an I. Okay, I don't know where that came from. Oh, you happy? Um, run. Yeah, people are going to change colors, but in a contagious sort of. Actually, are they going to change colors? Uh, are 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 people in networks right now? No, they're not in networks. Here's this recovered one, but uh, but they're actually not yet in networks. We need to put into place, ladies and gentlemen, um, a uh, a network here, a network that that basically connects to um, to people and that breaks them. So we're right now. There's no network in place. There's no network, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go to main. We're going to scroll down to space and networks, and um, you notice here it just says it's a GIS space. Fair enough. But we're going to go to person here, and we're going to connect people to their connections. We can't auto-configure it because it's going to be dynamic. This is a model that's going to have dynamic networks. So back to the mobility state chart. Right now, nobody's connected with anyone. Everyone's disconnected, fragmented, ladies and gentlemen, like grains of sand, atomistic. Okay, here we're going to go to at home, and we're going to connect people up. So this too will be an aspect of GIS. Okay, we're going to go to their to their home, and when they're at home, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to connect them at home. To other agents within a, w that are close to them. So this is how we do it. We go to at home state, and we're going to say this dot agents in range 1.0. So one who are right on top of us, and for each of them, this is our for each again. We are going to do something. What are we going to do for each of the agents within range? Can anyone say? S sorry, we're going to connect to them. 
So what does for each no need to do its job? Can anyone remember? It well, what do we give for each? We give it a function, a function, and that function takes in the person on which to operate in this case, because we're asking for agents. And here we're going to say person this, sorry, this dot connected to. Who is this here? It's me. It's the person who is um, who is being um, being moved connect to the person who is in range of me within one one unit. So let me go put that up on the big screen here. Here we go. Whoa. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so so I'm saying, look, tell me all people within a certain range of me. And then for each of them, do this. Okay, for each of them, get a reference to them, and then connect me to them. Does that make sense? No. So I am asking for, good question. Oh, okay. So you're saying, could I be connected to myself? Yes, I actually am connected to myself. It's true, but uh, uh, that's that's tr that's true. Um, uh, good, good, good point. I don't know that it's a giant thing, but um, uh, yeah, we need to. Um, we could say if okay. That's a good point. I think agents in range does this, but I'm actually not sure. Maybe someone could check. Does it give back yourself or not? If so, what we could say is if person's not equal to this, then then connect. Question back there? Question? Yeah. Sorry? Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so this is what we connect to in the entry action here. And then in the exit action, what we're going to do is, what are we going to do? We are going to disconnect myself. So when we're leaving to commute to work, we're going to disconnect from myself, or myself, this dot connections dot disconnect from all. Okay? Disconnect from all. Boom. So I'm going to disconnect from all my connections. Okay? I'll put that up there on the big screen as well. Boom. Um, so this is the exit action. And the first one is the entry action. Now, the good thing is, ladies and gentlemen, the, the same code goes where? Yeah, at work. So we're going to connect to the people that work with us when we go to work. And and then when we leave work, we're going to disconnect from them all. Okay. So this is a dynamic network, ladies and gentlemen. We are connecting people who happen to be located near us, and we end up we end up um being connected to those people for the duration of our uh, of our time there. Okay, now you'll notice that something is happening over time. What's happening within the fair city of Saskatoon as people go to work? Some people, perhaps even at the university, what's happening? Is the infection limited to two individuals? No, it's spread. It's spread amongst the different locations, ladies and gentlemen. So we connected people, we connected people up whilst they were at work to others at work. We connect them up whilst they were at home to others at home. They interact with the people at work. Maybe, maybe I'm an infectious person. I go to my work. I infect 10 other people at work. Those 10 people bring it to their homes. Each of them infects their partner, or they infect their whole family, and each of those people bring it to their locations, right? They bring it 
their son works at McDonald's, their, uh, you know, maybe the husband works at this other workplace, and they disseminate it. And it ends up spreading, ladies and gentlemen, across the city. So here, we do see a couple people who have been, sp who have been spared by the great plague of 2017 in Saskatoon. There's a, a few people, but most people, ladies and gentlemen, are gray. Gray as a zombie. Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we um, we we have a little model now of spread of infection, um, and that model is tied in with location. So now we have mobility on a geographic space where you know the actual time taken to get to a destination is shaped by that space. While people are together, they're connected. And by virtue of being connected, they can interact, and they can spread infection. And by virtue of spreading infection um, at one place, they can, because of mobility, bring it to other places. It disseminates to other places, which um, can then spread there and disseminate elsewhere, all around the locations um, as, as characterized geographically. But ladies and gentlemen, there's something that we haven't captured yet. And there's something that almost is begging us to capture this model, okay? Um, and that has to do with another feature of the model that we added before. By the way, obviously you could add schools to this, right? You could have people going to elementary school, people going to university, spreading the flu. The professor could bring the flu into a classroom. And even as, as he lectures, asymptomatic, not aware yet how ill he is, he could spread it to, to others who could disseminate it around the city. Um, uh, you, could, you could add a lot of texture even given the, the features of the model now. But let's not, let's not focus on that. Let's, let's push ourselves a little bit for, for something else interesting, OK? So ladies and gentlemen, this is going to actually take us to another stage of our work here. Um, I would like to go and opens up some opportunities for incorporating more geographic features. Time is short, so we'll have to be, um, we'll have to triage a couple things, but I hope to add just a few additional elements. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do is, um, is add to the state chart here uh, a transition or a new state. This new state will be a state called, and actually, I'm sorry, first, even before we do this, we'll go back to Maine. We're going to add to Maine a uh, mean uh, immunity duration, okay? Um, this is going to be here just uh, 30 30 days, 30 times days, okay? 30 times day, excuse me, I don't think you say days. Um, there may be a days as well, but I think it's, it's day here. So 30 days, okay? Mean immunity duration, and what is that going to affect here? Where am I going with that? Yeah, so it's how long your immunity lasts. So now we're gonna have people going
think I think we're back in business. Okay, thank you. Um, so in this case, they actually won't spread it, and they don't know they're sick until they they're infectious. So they're neither symptomatic nor they're spreading. So here we're going to ask they be infected. So here what you can do is say this dot in state. We're going to ask are they in the state person dot infected. The reason I'm saying person dot is because sometimes you want to actually test this um, uh, external to so the person. This is actually a, a static member variable, static constant, and you have to. It's, a, it's because it's static. You have to refer to the to the class if you refer to it externally. And to avoid people getting confused, I like to just always say person dot infected. Um, okay, so. Yeah, it's not like we have an infected, uh, um, infected, uh, uh, infected hospital or something like that. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, so they're going to go there. Where are they going to go when they go to care? Anyone? Yeah, they're going to go to the nearest clinic. Okay. Um, so this is what we do um, when they go here. We're going to get a clinic. Okay, um, well, we'll just say this dot move to, move to, and it's going to be um, uh, move to, and it'll be this dot get nearest agent in main dot clinics, ladies and gentlemen, clinics. We're going to move them to the nearest clinic. Okay, um, uh, so we're going to ask of all the clinics that are in Maine. You can go up and, and check them out. Um, we're going to have a set of clinics. They're right here. We are going to move that person to the nearest amongst them to themselves. Okay, and they're going to move there, and then. Um, they're going to be there under care. Well, actually, I said message, but we're running out of time. We'll leave that for another time. We're going to do this as a timeout. After three hours, for example, they will, soon enough, we'll have a waiting list. We'll have people who come there. It's too long. They wait. They leave. They don't actually get care. They continue to spread the infection, et cetera. But here, we're going to assume they come back in three hours, and uh, the action here is going to be one of twofold. Number one, they're going to do what? They're going to head where? They're going to do move to, I know, I can tell what's on some of your minds. Um, this dot move to this dot home, right? Okay. Um, secondly, what's going to happen to them? Well, right now we're representing they go to the clinic and the clinic's benefits are immediate or after three hours. It's like they go to the clinic and they walk through a healing beam that, that radiates their body with goodness and they emerge fully healed from the clinic, okay? Which is Admittedly, an approximation to the way our healthcare system works right now. Uh, wouldn't you agree? Um, so, okay. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to need to cure them. And the way in which we'll cure them in the, mo in the final minute here is we will send them a what? What will we send them? A message, yeah. A wise, wise cracker might have said, "We'll send them flowers or something." But, but no, no, we'll send them a message, ladies and gentlemen. So there's going to be a transition here called cured, which is going to go from infective to recovered. So when they receive that message, there. But there's a problem here because we're going to have to distinguish between two messages, okay? And here, when they we're going to send them a message, we're going to say. 
ladies and gentlemen, infection state chart dot receive receive message and it will say ladies and gentlemen cured okay the problem is right now it confuses those two messages why does it confuse those two messages because the two message transitions here it doesn't pay attention to what message it is so Ladies and gentlemen, once more into the breach. This will take about two minutes. I, we need to distinguish between those messages, and we should not do it with strings, because strings can be mistyped. You could say cured with an exclamation point one time and cured without it, and you won't notice the difference. We need to do something which is more principled than that. We need to go to the model, and we need to add the equivalent of any num. In what's called an option list. And this will be called messages. And it will define for us the possible messages. So if we mistype it, it will tell us that it will mistype. It knows the possible messages. It won't just let us type anything cured with an exclamation point, cured without. So there's going to be two messages infect, and what's the other one? Cured, ladies and gentlemen. Cured. Okay, um, they, are, they are cured. We've added two messages, and now, where do we have to go to send those messages? Anyone? Well, to send, the, to, to send an infect message, we have to do it here. Messages.infect. Boom. And here, what do we have to do? We have to change this on a particular message, and the message will be what? Messages dot speak on. No, no, <laughs> that won't bring them to an effect, exposed state, hopefully. Cured brings them to this state, I would hope. The cure, otherwise, the cure is worse than the disease. Okay? Um, so this one is based on messages dot cured. And there's one other place in the model we have to change. Where is it? Where's the one other place? We change this to send an infect message. We change this to transition on an infect message. We change this to transition on a cured message. Where's the one other place we need to modify? Yeah, it's in the initial infect. We need to change this to, to do what? Oh, yes, we have to, that's true. We have to do one more, more place, too. Good good call. What's What do we have to do here? It has to say messages dot, in fact, and finally, there's one more place in person right here where it needs to send the message what? What is it sending here? Messages dot cured. Cool. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we just did that. Now we have well-defined messages. If we misspelled cured, we'll know about it. And now people are going, and now you notice the population burden of disease? It's much lower now. Why is that? Why is the population burden of disease so much lower? Before, we had a very large fraction of the population that was infected. Now we actually have very large numbers being susceptible. What have we added? What have we changed? Yeah. We put into place universal health care. Everyone can go in, and they're actually going to the clinic. So if, if you'll actually go, you'll see sometimes people will, will go to the nearest clinic here, and they'll present for care. And uh, at that point, they will be um, uh, cured of their maladies, OK? Um, as if a healing beam has been conferred upon them. So they're going into the clinic. And, you know, if, if we were to exaggerate it and make their time in the clinic be, you know, 3,000 hours, I won't, I won't ask you to do this, but 3,000 hours, so they have to spend lots more time in the clinic, you would see them spending time there in the clinic. Um, yeah, here, here they're piling up. See that? There's Royal University Hospital, City Hospital, St. Paul's. Um, West Side Clinic or or West Winds, they're piling up uh, in there because they are um, 
uh, they are uh, there for a very long period of time. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have care seeking now. We have mobility among fixed locations that are defined by geographic space. We have mobility among among uh, areas chosen randomly in regions. We have people's mobility shaping how long it takes them to get to work. We have spread of infection at the workplace based on co-located people. People who happen to be together for a while, they can bring them back to home where people congregate and it can spread a uh, geographically located way there. Um, we also have individuals who are um, traveling back and forth to get cured at actual um, locations of healthcare facilities. We will be adding to this model just a little bit more, probably in the next section, to add in a few components associated with representing what's called discrete event modeling, where people are going to progress down stages of service delivery within the uh, care facilities. And the number of doctors and nurses will affect their ability to be handled. Some people will leave without being seen because they're waiting too long and will continue to spread the infection. Um, but for now, I will post this model. Thank you for your patience. And uh, I will look uh, forward to getting this to you. I did, as per my email, again, uh, take home exercise six. Uh, I canceled it as a hand in. You don't have to worry about that. Exercise seven is due um, uh, is due on Thursday, I believe, um, and you will want to attend to that. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, one final thing for those pursuing group projects, um, uh, I appreciate. I've been talking with many of you about your projects. I want to make clear because it's come up with some issues that for group projects there is both a group assignment of marks and an individual assignment of marks within that. So individuals who are, who are putting in more time and more effort, who I see more and contacting me about the project, will receive grades that are correspondingly higher in terms of the marks. Not everyone in the same project is going to receive the same marks, and there'll be quantitative as well as qualitative ways of assessing that. Thank you very much. Right. Yes.